the air with details just into us about another day of deadly gun violence in America's school. This time at a high school in Iowa where they're getting ready for vigils tonight after a sixth grader was killed. Others hurt when a student started firing before the bell rang. We're live on the ground with what we're just learning in the last hour. Then the East Coast set to see something it hasn't seen much of for a while. Snow. But will it be a boom or a bust? We've got the forecast just ahead. Plus, if love is blind, are producers turning a blind eye to bad behavior? That's the allegation from a contestant on that dating show who says the bosses ignored potential threats from the guy they set her up with. More on the legal fight that could bring a sea change to reality TV. Then, in our original, we take you inside the place they call Prisneyland in California. Will this big experiment to make prisons more comfortable for inmates mean they'll never come back? And later, fans trashing an upcoming Star Wars movie directed by a woman that hasn't even started shooting yet. We're going to talk about what's behind this preemptive backlash, if you will, later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and in just the last hour, Iowa police are confirming a student is the one who opened fire at a high school there, killing a sixth grader and hurting five other people, with yet another school now and yet another community in anger and in grief. Here's what we know. This morning, a 17-year-old, according to police, started shooting first thing in Perry, Iowa turning what was supposed to be a welcome back on the first day after the holidays into a nightmare. After his attack, he died by suicide. With this school now, yet another school and yet another community in anger and in grief in this country. Late tonight, the town's police chief getting choked up. Watch. All of our condolences to the victims and their families. They need your thoughts and prayers as well as time and space to process and to grieve. Classes, of course, are canceled there tomorrow, along with several other schools in the area, as the community gets ready for vigils later on tonight. Ali Vitali was on the ground in Perry, Iowa, within minutes of the shooting. She is joining us now live tonight. So, Ali, explain what happened here, because it wasn't just a gun. Police say they found some kind of explosive, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's new information just in the last hour or so, Hallie, from law enforcement briefing us here on the scene of Perry High School and Middle School. We learned two new pieces of information from that briefing. The first, the tragic news of the fact that one person has been killed by the shooter. That person was a sixth grader. They surmise that it was possible, even though all of this happened in the high school, that because it happened before classes officially had started, it happened earlier than 7.30 in the morning and classes don't start until closer to eight, that because of the way students were congregating, that's how a middle schooler could have ended up in the high school. But the second piece of information that we got from law enforcement officials here is the fact that in addition to coming to the school with two guns, the shooter also had an improvised explosive device with them. Law enforcement officials here on the scene say that they found that it was rudimentary and eventually they deemed it safe. But clearly to have some kind of an IUD belies that there must have been some level of planning here for this. What else do we know about the sixth grader who was killed, Allie, or the other victims who are still in the hospital tonight? There had been a lot of sort of things flying around. What's confirmed now tonight? <laughs> We're still pretty light on specific details here, Hallie. Of course, we know that the sixth grader was killed in this shooting. We also know that there are five people injured. Among them is one school administrator. We don't know that specific person's role, but we do know that it's a member of faculty, it's school personnel. We're waiting for further guidance and information on the status of those victims. But at the point that we heard from the press or just in the last few minutes, none of those injuries are at this point deemed life-threatening. But it's more than just bodily harm that you're dealing with in this community now. It's the shock, it's the terror, and it's the tragedy of this moment. And all of that is psychological, something that this community is going to be dealing with for a while, including this mother who I spoke to this morning, who talked about the highs and lows of this morning, getting the text message from her kids that this is happening and what it felt like after that. Watch. What was it like getting that phone call? Uh, actually, it was a text message this morning from my daughter, and it was absolutely horrifying. Like, that's one of the worst moments of my entire life, but the best phone call I got was saying that they were okay. I'm glad that they're okay. So, of course, that mother, thankful for the relief that she was able to feel, but she also told me she just never thought that this could happen in her community, and how many times have we heard that at the scenes of these mass yeah. shootings, Hallie?
You know, I was just thinking about how it, this has happened in so many communities in this country, and that is something that is part of the context and the backdrop of the school shooting, and something that the White House addressed pretty head on with the, with the press secretary there today saying it's only the fourth day. You know, what is it? January 4th. And already we now have another school shooting in America. Here's Green Jump here. The question that we ask is when will enough be enough? The questions that families ask and the victims of families ask is when will it be enough? Of course, the question from a policy perspective always turns to the potential for any changes to the nation's gun laws and where you sit in the political divide likely determines your thoughts on that. What is your sense, Ali, as you cover, of course, both, you know, Iowa and Washington here of any appetite to make any changes on the federal or even the state level on this front? What we're told is a school administrator. I think it's probably slim to none. I mean, look, you know, I cover Congress in my day job. The only reason I'm in Iowa right now is because I'm covering the Iowa caucus, which is happening in less than two weeks. So of course, Republican presidential candidates are out here in force. They're not talking about policy changes. They're talking about thoughts and prayers. It's the same conversation, frankly, that we have on Capitol Hill with lawmakers all the time. Just a year and a half ago, they were able to do what was called the most significant gun reform legislation in 20 years. And even that, frankly, pretty much nibbled around the edges on background checks and on incentivizing red flag laws in states. It was important, but it was not an overhaul of a system that so clearly badly needs changes. Ali Vitali live for us there in Perry. Ali, thank you very much. We're going to check back in with you. I know in our team if we get any updates later on tonight. Appreciate it. Tonight, a top diplomat's on the move to try to keep the war between Israel and Hamas from spilling over into a huge regional conflict. With Secretary of State Tony Blinken on the way to the Middle East for the fourth time since October 7th, basically trying to calm things down after Tuesday's strike on a Beirut suburb that killed a senior Hamas commander. That's led to some big concerns now of an escalation possible between Hezbollah militants and the Israelis. Blinken's set to visit a bunch of countries in the region. You can see him here. With the diplomatic efforts happening while the war, of course, in Gaza continues. As tonight, we're learning about the daring and unprecedented rescue of the mother and uncle of a U.S. service member, both living in Gaza, caught in the crossfire for months. You can see the rescued mom. She's the one highlighted on the right there. The operation, coordinated by U.S., Israeli, and Egyptian officials, believed to be the first of its kind to pull civilians out of Gaza. NBC's, in the battlefield at least, NBC's Josh Letterman is live for us in Tel Aviv. So Josh, start with the diplomatic front here and the moves on diplomacy, because this is not the first time that we're seeing Tony Blinken show up in the region, something that you had, a trip that you had reported would happen, of course. It's his fourth time since this war started. What's going to be different for him this time? Well, there will be a big focus during this visit, Hallie, on trying to boost humanitarian aid into Gaza, trying to get those hostages home, including six American citizens still believed to be hostage uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, as well as trying to minimize Palestinian uh, casualties in the remaining weeks or potentially months of this war. But usually uh, when the secretary of state is heading to a country like Israel, uh, there's a big focus and flowery language from the State Department on the opportunity to work closely with one of uh, the most staunch U.S. allies in the region. Not so this time. Take a listen to what the State Department had to say. We don't expect every conversation on this trip to be easy. There are obviously tough issues facing the region and difficult choices ahead. But the Secretary believes it is the responsibility of the United States of America to lead diplomatic efforts to tackle those challenges head on, and he is prepared to do that in the days to come. Now, the toughest issue on this trip, according to U.S. officials, Hallie, is going to be what comes after Hamas and who governs uh, the Gaza Strip. The U.S. Uh, and Israel have been publicly at odds uh, over that. The U.S. wants the Palestinian Authority in charge. Israel says that's not going to happen. And tonight uh, put forward a very detailed plan in which they say they want local Palestinian groups to do that instead. We also mentioned, Josh, as we're looking at the uh, the agenda there for the secretary's fourth Middle East trip, we're also learning more about that rescue operation that got the mother, the uncle of a U.S. service member out of Gaza. Talk us through that. And importantly, I think, talk us through what this means for other Americans, right? There are other Americans who remain in Gaza. What does this mean for them? 
Yeah, so we should first make a distinction that uh, there are American citizens who are in Gaza because they were there when the war started, That's and right. then there are hostages. These are not right. hostages. These were Americans, or people who were in uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, and many Americans had been able to get out early in the war through the Rafa boarding, uh, border crossing into Egypt. Uh, these two individuals apparently had been unable to do that. They were uh, trapped in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, uh, apparently in between buildings where there were Hamas uh, terrorists that were located. Uh, and so now we have learned that there was this operation involving the Israeli military with some coordination with the United States and with Egypt uh, to safely get them out of the Gaza Strip, where they are now uh, outside of Gaza and in safer territory, very much to the relief of their families. Josh Letterman, live for us there in Tel Aviv tonight. Uh, great work, Josh, as always. Thank you. Let's bring it back here to home because millions of people across this country are getting ready for a big winter storm that's set to sweep the country. We're talking rain and maybe a bunch of snow in the East Coast, maybe this weekend. Forecasts say there's a messy mix in our future. Places like Connecticut are already seeing some flurries. You've got other spots, too, like New York, where the governor is saying today that the emergency response teams are getting ready. Meteorologist Bill Karens has the forecast. And the big question, Bill, you know, it, we always say this. It is winter. In the winter, it is cold and it snows, right? The, yes. the part of the news here is that we haven't seen snow in some of these spots for almost two years. Is that going to change this weekend? What's the model showing you? Yeah, some people and some kids will have a lot to play in and a lot to plow and hmm. shovel and have to navigate through. But the areas that haven't had snow in now two years, we're talking the big cities on I-95, this one looks more of a miss than a hit. So the storm is now in New Mexico. The snow is breaking out in North Texas. It's going to snow tonight in areas of southern Kansas, a little bit in Oklahoma. Our friends in Wichita, Kansas, under a winter weather advisor, you're going to wake up and have to do a little bit of shoveling tomorrow morning and cleaning the car off. Maybe even northern Arkansas, Fort Smith, just a little coating here uh, that could always cause some hazards but what's changed the winter storm watches are now being issued for areas of the northeast that's why we're now the 23 million people including albany hartford and boston new york city philly baltimore dc not under a winter storm watch and that's your first kind of flag of it's not going to be as bad there so tonight this is that one to three inches in areas of kansas and northern texas a little bit impossible as we go through the ohio valley but the heavier stuff this doesn't really start until midday saturday continuing through saturday night and right through Sunday. And here's kind of my first call forecast. And I've still left a chance of an inch in the D.C. area. There's always a chance, Hallie, but uh, it's not looking good. If you're pretty much <laughs> I-95 to it. the... Don't do it for me. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to adjust it for you. Uh, I-95 to the coast, you're going to be too warm. A lot of areas will be rainy. Uh, same for New York City southwards. But you only have to go like 10 miles away from I-95. And then you're talking 6 to 12 inches of snow in northern wow. New Jersey and Connecticut, Hartford. So it's a really fine line, and the Catskills get nailed, the Poconos, southern Vermont, uh, most of Massachusetts. Boston, out of all the big cities, that's one of the harder forecasts. The airport could get, like, one to three inches. Then you go by the I-95 loop, you know, five miles inland, and you could get much as six inches. So we will get a little bit of ice out of this, too. But, you know, Hallie, if this storm was happening typically this time of year, and we've already had two or three, we'd kind of be like, eh, it's a storm on the weekend, you know, good thing it's not ruining us, you know, travel plans or work or school. Uh, but since it hasn't happened in a while, uh, you know, everyone's kind of interested. Including us, of course, and our yeah, viewers. Bill Karens, thank you so much. Right. Appreciate you. Thanks. So listen, we've got some news here coming into us on the Jeffrey Epstein documents. And I say it that way because I am sure that you have heard about that already. That is because there is the expectation that more of these documents will be released in the coming days. So far, 40 exhibits and more than 900 pages have been unsealed in the first batch of documents with the names of people linked to Epstein, released as part of a lawsuit against Epstein's longtime accomplice, Jelaine Maxwell. Here's what we know so far, right? Attorney Alan Dershowitz, magician David Copperfield, British royal Prince Andrew, Michael Jackson, billionaire Glenn Dubin, former presidents Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, named in these documents. Now, you might be going, what does named mean? Simply that, simply that their names are showing up. None of these people are accused of wrongdoing in these documents from a criminal perspective there. Just because their name doesn't mean they did something wrong. Tom Winter is joining us now. And Tom, I didn't want to get over my skis on this, but I, it's my understanding that more documents have just been released by the court. Um, we were expecting perhaps another trench, maybe another one after this. W can you just tell me what we know so far here tonight? 
Uh, sure, Hallie. I actually just checked the docket here as we were coming to air. I don't. I, I think what there has been is there's been a refiling of, uh, of okay. documents. So that's what Great. we have uh, at this point, and that's um, somewhat to be expected because there are a whole ton of names here, and it's possible that some individuals objected to their personal information, telephone numbers, emails, the like, uh, coming out. Central to what you've been talking about, what you've been discussing. Yes, there are a lot of names here, but a lot of those names are familiar to people that have followed this story. Because because as you and I kind of alluded to and, and kind of previewed yesterday, there were a number of names that were in Jeffrey Epstein's address book, his so-called black book. A lot of that came out in trial and previous civil litigation. And these names that you referenced are not accused of, of any wrongdoing, uh, just that these individuals were associated or in, we've seen the pictures here in the last several seconds, uh, have been with former presidents and have been associated with him in the past. And so there's a number of references uh, to all of these individuals. I think the most interesting one was that David Copperfield, at least according to the testimony of one of the individuals who says that she was recruited uh, for the basis of, uh, of conducting sexual massages with Jeffrey Epstein, said that David Copperfield asked her about the, uh, about the women that were hanging around and questioned their ages. But there's absolutely no indication at all that Copperfield was involved in any sort of wrongdoing. And he, of course, he's uh, denied any wrongdoing. Michael Jackson, who we're looking at now, was uh, somebody that that same woman identified as uh, one time being at Jeffrey Epstein's house. Again, no accusations there specific to Jackson. So a lot of high profile names. But as we talked about yesterday, not a lot of new information as far as uh, any sort of actual uh, wrongdoing or criminal conduct. And yet this is a story, right, this document drop that has captured the attention of the country. And I don't sure. think that's overstating it. I mean, you look, it's, it's headlines, sort of headline news everywhere. How do how should we be thinking about that piece of it? And what else is still to come here? Well, I expect uh, probably several hundred pages as soon as this evening. That's something we'll continue to follow. Uh, and, and obviously, we have a lot more to get through here. Last night was just kind of the first tranche, as you alluded to. As far as how we understand it, Hallie, I think it's important, obviously, and you and I have spoken about this before on and off camera, there's a lot of focus here on who is in Jeffrey Epstein's circle. Were any of these individuals involved with uh, abusing these underage girls? Uh, I think there's also the component here of how robust this police investigation was leading up to that what has been referred to as a sweetheart plea deal. They had a number of victims, very clear testimony, recorded phone calls, recorded conversations, police surreptitiously uh, recording as they brought some of these girls home, talking about what happened because they didn't want to discuss what had happened initially to investigators. So I think it raises more questions ultimately about that plea deal. And as we talked about yesterday, that's something we're going to continue to watch for as these documents come out. Tom Winter, thank you. Uh, we will see if we get any action, of course, tonight or tomorrow as it relates to these documents. I know you're staying close to a camera. Thanks. Let's take you out west because a man who attacked a Vegas judge during his sentencing is refusing to go back to court to face new charges today. This whole thing was captured on video. And look at this. This guy leaps over the bench, attacks the judge. We're going to show it to you, but we have to say first, it is graphic. Here it is. You see here the Clark County District Judge. There she is. Oof, Mary Kay Holthus. The defendant comes flying at her over the top of the judge's bench, lands on top of her. I mean, that was people jump in. You see court officials, even I guess an attorney jumps in at one point trying to hold this guy back. She is okay. She had some injuries, but a courtroom marshal was hospitalized. Apparently a bleeding gash on his forehead. You see it again there, a dislocated shoulder. It is almost unbelievable to watch. Liz Kreutz is joining us now. What it, help us understand this, because this defendant was being sentenced on a battery charge here. What was behind the moments that we didn't see on camera? Hey, Hallie. Yeah, so, okay, so the attacker here is 30-year-old Deobra Redden, and he has a history of violent crimes. He was back in court pleading guilty to attempted battery with substantial bodily harm, and he was trying to ask the judge for a plea deal. He was standing there making the case that he's in a better place and asking the judge not to sentence him to prison again. She was really not buying it. She went through his whole rap sheet and actually said to him, I think it's time for you to get a taste of something else and that is what triggered him and that's what made him then jump out uh, over the uh, defendant desk
desk into the judge's um, area there tackling her. Now, as you mentioned, um, this did turn into a bloody brawl. Thankfully, the district attorney's office says that the uh, judge is doing okay. She's shaken up. She has some bruises, but she's fine. And yeah, they wanted him back in court today. He's facing more charges now. He refused. So now uh, the district attorney says he'll be back in court. And the court says he'll be back for a hearing on Tuesday. We'll see if he shows up there, Hallie. Listen, we'd be remiss, Liz, not to talk about this in the context. And it, listen, it, it is a bit of a different context, but still, of um, this issue of the personal safety of those in our judiciary, right? The, the, the personal safety mm -hmm. of judges who are doing the work on whatever, you know, local or higher level of upholding the law here. Give us more on that context and that backdrop, because we can't ignore that piece of it either. Yeah, definitely not. And it's something that even the court in Las Vegas is acknowledging when they put out a statement last night. They even said, um, you know, we're committed to safety of our employees. They said we're going to be reviewing our protocols to make sure that it's safe for their employees and the judges. But we've seen this before. People targeting uh, judges, retaliating them for their decisions, not just in the courtrooms, but actually going to their homes. And there's been legislation in recent years that's been passed to actually try to protect the personal information of judges because of these security concerns, Hallie. Liz Kreutz, live for us on all of that. It is just uh, wild to see and wild to hear about. Thank you very much. We've got some pretty wild video coming up, too, of a robbery in California, a car backing into the building, people grabbing, look at this, anything they can. We're live with the latest on that investigation. Plus, one big drug company launching a new website to let patients get those prescription weight loss drugs online. We'll tell you why some experts are raising the red flag. To a legal fight now that has the potential to make a sea change in reality TV as we know it. And it's starting with Love is Blind. A contestant from that show is fighting with Netflix and its production company Delirium after they went after her for breaking her NDA. Have you seen Love is Blind? Do you know it? It's the show that like basically tries to get people to get engaged before they ever actually see each other, right? Idea being you base it on personality and conversation and not on looks. Well, this contestant, Renee Pache, claims the guy she got engaged to ended up being violent and the producers did not do enough when she brought it to their attention. Watch. They all mm -hmm. saw his violence. They, this was not surprising. It wasn't hidden. It was, I think they were just as scared as I was, but they didn't, you know, let me stop filming. So she's talking about it, and now Poche's lawsuit says Delirium wants $4 million for violating an NDA. She wants that NDA thrown out. We reached out to Netflix and Delirium for comment. They didn't get back to us. Let's bring in Chloe Malas here. So let's go micro and then macro, Chloe. Start micro with the specifics of what happened here with this Love is Blind incident. Poche says she finished out the show, but then her storyline didn't actually air. What's the case? So... Hallie, she says, you know, she's this Texas veterinarian and she was approached in 2021 to appear on this hit show, Love is Blind. Like you said, there's all this romance before you meet each other and it's all done behind like these like shadowy mm -hmm. walls. And, you know, you're supposed to kind of like fall in love with someone's personality before you ever see them, um, you know, because it's what's in the heart. It's not what's outside. But she says that when she got paired up with this guy, that it turns out that he was homeless, addicted to drugs, a negative amount in his bank account, and that he was violent, and that she was actually warned by producers while filming that he needed, she needed to make sure that he didn't have access to firearms because they were concerned that he might hurt himself, and that she voiced her concerns to producers and to those around her that she did not feel comfortable. And Delirium TV, uh, the production company that puts out Love is Blind. They haven't returned NBC News's request for comment. But what they have said previously is that they have a pretty strict vetting process. Now, she is, you know, countersuing uh, for undisclosed claims because she's saying, first of all, I made $8,000 from the show and you're suing me for $4 million for an NDA that I believe is illegal and unenforceable. Here's a little bit from Danny Savalos, our NBC News legal correspondent what he had to say. While arbitration clauses and NDAs are generally enforceable, sometimes they're too ambitious. They go too far and they break the law. In California, for example, a non-disparagement clause cannot prevent someone from reporting illegal conduct. So she says 
that Delirium TV, Poche says, that they are trying to silence her, that they don't want the truth to come out of what is actually taking place on that show, Hallie. So go, so it's fascinating to, to see and hear these details, Chloe, but go macro here, right? Because this legal fight has the potential, maybe, depending on how it goes, to affect not just this specific show or production company, but for more of the industry as a whole. Explain that. I would imagine it would have to do with the use of MDAs, for example, or with some of these vetting procedures, et cetera. So Bethany Frankel, who you might know from The Real Housewives of New York, that's where she rose to fame, she has been on a crusade to go after these production companies, these NDAs, and these reality franchises saying, you pay next to nothing for these people, you make so much money, and you create these unsafe, at times, working conditions. And so she's been very public about this, and I think that lawsuits like these, and Poche has hired Mark Garagos, a very, very well-known mm. uh, attorney, to represent her. I think that these are the types of cases that could change the face of reality TV and the types of the ways that they put these shows together. I want you to listen to Brian Stelter, um, a former CNN colleague of mine, um, and now he works at Vanity Fair, and listen to what he had to say, because he's an expert when it comes to television. What we might be seeing across the reality TV space is a rebalancing of power, giving some of these contestants a little bit more power and changing the working conditions that these shows are produced under. It'll be interesting to see if anything changes because reality TV, the reason why you see so much of it is because it's a lot cheaper to make. Um, and we saw the rise of it during the, the Hollywood strikes that took place. Not this one, but the one before the one that we just had. That is where you saw these shows like Big Brother and Survivor really boom. And it'll be interesting to see now that there's so much reality TV everywhere. Will there be more lawsuits like this one? Totally. What other stories are out there, Hallie? And could reality TV change as we know it. Chloe Malas, thank you so much for all of that, uh, that detail and that reporting. Really appreciate it. Let's take you to Southern California now because there's some pretty stunning new surveillance video showing the moment that this street takeover crash thing turned into an all-out burglary. Look at this. So it started when this white car, you see it, backs up. That's a bakery that it's backing up into. Um, it's in Compton, less than a mile away from where a huge group of people had crowded around for a street takeover. That's when cars like take over an intersection, like do all these turns, they do drifting, et cetera, et cetera. Then this happens, you're seeing it. Dozens of people go and rush into the store. Most of them are masked. They go in, they're grabbing stuff, food, money, jumping over the counter, knocking things down, pushing over racks. I wanna bring in Maya Eaglin for more on this. What happened to these people? Were any of them caught? Was there any fallout here? Hi, Hallie. So Los Angeles officials say that no one was hurt in this incident and no arrests have been made yet. But we do know that this group of about 100 people organized in the streets around 3 a.m. Tuesday, right before a white Kia backed into the front of Ruben's Bakery and Mexican food. Now, according to police, the looters grabbed drinks, food, lotto tickets and even meat scales before the small store was scheduled to reopen at 6 a.m. Hallie. What about the community more broadly here, right? The idea of a street takeover, the idea of these kinds of incidents happening, it's not, you know, this is obviously extraordinarily dramatic video, so it's hitting sort of a level of newsworthiness that we haven't often seen, but talk us through the bigger picture. Yeah, we've been seeing an increase in looting and shoplifting across the country. This is definitely not an isolated incident. According to a 2023 study from the Council on Criminal Justice, New York and Los Angeles have experienced the highest increases in shoplifting, with Virginia Beach and Dallas coming right behind. These crimes are leaving residents frustrated, and Compton's Mayor Emma Sharf had this to say about the incident. Ensuring the safety of businesses and residents in our city is our top priority. No local business should endure such fear and destruction. So we'll be keeping an eye on if any arrests will be made in this case. Hallie? Maya England, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Islamic State group claiming responsibility for the bombings targeting a commemoration for an Iranian general yesterday. There's a piece of new information coming into us tonight. Dozens of people died, hundreds were hurt in the worst militant attack to hit Iran in decades. Number two, the Vatican is now defending the Pope's recent move to allow blessings for same-sex couples. That's a new rule that came out last month. Remember, we covered it on this show. It was immediately hit with criticism from some bishops around the world who said they wouldn't actually implement this policy. The Vatican insists there is nothing heretical involved in the Pope's decision. 
Number three, police in New Zealand say a fisherman's survival is a miracle. He was trying to reel in a fish when he fell into the water, lost his boat, like couldn't get back in. He was in the water for like 24 hours. How did he get rescued? He used his watch to reflect the sun, they say, to catch the attention of some other fishermen. He was hypothermic, but otherwise is expected to be okay. Number four, a bit of a surprise for fans of TGI Fridays, which announces it's abruptly shutting down something like 40 locations this week in 12 stores. The company says the stores were underperforming and that the closures are part of its overall growth strategy. It's offering a thousand transfer opportunities for employees who worked at the stores that are now gonna be shuttered. Number five, data analytics firm Sirium is just releasing results on the most punctual airport in the world. I'm gonna give you a second to guess, where do you think the most on-time flights take off from? Minneapolis, St. Paul. How about it? How about it in the world? The MSP, that's a big deal. SLC, also a big deal. Salt Lake City, fifth on the list. The other American city. All right. Not bad airports to fly in and out of, I know from experience. Coming up here on the show, a lot more to get to, including NBC News' exclusive interview with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis less than two weeks to the Iowa caucuses. What he's telling us tonight about what polling suggests could be a fight for second place there. Plus, why the biggest stadium in New York City is going to take out a bunch of seats. Stay with us. Florida governor and 2024 candidate Ron DeSantis tonight is pushing back on the idea that he is no longer now the top challenger to former President Donald Trump in a new exclusive interview. Listen to what he told our Dasha Burns. You're then much my closer in the race to Nikki Haley than you are to Trump. What happened? Well, no. I mean, first of all, Trump has always been leading in the race. I mean, he's the former president. He's uh, one of the most famous people in there. But you're not even the top there. challenger so to him now. We are the top. Um, they wouldn't be spending that money if we weren't the top. I'm the only one that has a chance to beat Trump and win the general election. Okay, so that is Ron DeSantis' view of things. What is the view from the data perspective, from the polling perspective? Well, if the polls hold... Donald Trump is looking headed toward, candidly, potentially, a landslide win in Iowa. And whoever takes second place could end up double digits behind him, right? Meaning, yes, the fight for second place is one of the things that we're watching in Iowa. Former President Trump really hasn't been in the state a ton, but he is heading there tomorrow for a whole bunch of events this weekend. Eight of them starting on Friday. You can see the stops he's going to be making here all over the state. NBC's Dasha Burns is joining us now from Des Moines. So it's interesting to hear about this, Dasha, because listen, we, we are not fortune tellers here. Anything, many things could happen between now and the Iowa caucuses about 13 days away, right? Sure, like that is that is within the realm of possibility here. What mm -hmm. looks likely, right, if you look at the past precedent of history over the course of the last several months, is perhaps not much movement in the polls because we just haven't seen movement in the polls for the last several weeks. So how is Ron DeSantis and his team, importantly, grappling with this? Because it's one thing to hear from the candidate publicly on camera with you at the Des Moines Register. It's another to talk about ground game, about resources, where they're putting their money and their resources. Right. There's we're not fortune tellers, but what is likely we don't know. And what is uh, true, what we do yeah. know is what we've seen with this campaign over the course of the last year or so is that this guy started as the top contender, the, the guy that was fighting for first place with Donald Trump. And now he has found himself double digits behind Trump. And as I said, they're closer to Nikki Haley now fighting for second place. And in front of the camera with us, at least the way he's grappling with it, is denying that that's the case. He still says that uh, he is number one to, to, to beating Trump. But in terms of ground game, I mean, they have really focused in on Iowa. It, all bets are on the Hawkeye State. And in terms of the path forward after this, well, he hasn't necessarily articulated a very clear one. Just take a listen. In the Iowa basket. That's can not true. Can you name another but that, state but that's you think not you true. could win? That's not true. Can you name another state you could win? Yes, yes. You wait till what, what happens when we get out of Iowa. It's going to create, another a, state create a lot win? of. We're going to be able to win a lot of states. We have a great can organization in New Hampshire. We have a great organization in South Carolina. Do you Carolina. think you could win New Hampshire? We can have a lot of great organizations throughout Super Tuesday. I think that answer or, or lack thereof probably says a lot there, Hallie. 
Also interesting, they talked about the great organization in Iowa and then South Carolina, but skipped New Hampshire. And so uh, kudos to you for jumping in and, and trying to push that point here. When you talk about the person who is the front runner, it's former President Trump. We showed the map of all the places he's going to. It feels like this is a move to try to build up some momentum to make sure that people do turn out for the caucuses for him. Although it's interesting to hear how some of those uh, in his orbit are trying to now say, well, you know, people may be a little embarrassed to show up for Donald Trump, but it sounds like there's some expectation setting happening, even on the margins. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, Iowa is, uh, you know, the, the momentum and the narrative setting state. And there's a little bit of interesting history with, with Iowa and New Hampshire when it comes to Republicans. In the modern era, no Republican has won those two states back to back. The other thing here, as we learned from some Trump advisors, is that Iowa is a state where they're sort of beta testing their general election strategy because uh, it is a caucus, which means the organization is really cl critical here. And they're trying trying to see if they can expand Trump's electorate, because as we know, uh, it's really hard to flip a voter from Biden to Trump, right? But Trump does have a lot of pull with first-time voters, so they've got a really granular database strategy to try to turn out first-timers that they're trying here in the primary that they hope will work in the general, and that experimentation, it's, it's really a question mark of how that's going to play out, so that might be part of the factor here too, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Iowa. We are so glad to see you. Real quick, Dasha, who's next in your Closing Arguments interview series? We've got Nikki Haley tomorrow, All so right. look out. Sounds good. We'll be watching. We'll see you here then for that wrap-up. Dasha, thank you so much. Again, that's that exclusive interview series that Dasha's doing with the Des Moines Register. Nikki Haley, tomorrow. A lot more to get to here in the show because NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, police have arrested and charged a father and son today in connection with the killings of a pregnant 18-year-old girl who was about to give birth and her boyfriend in Texas last month. The son was charged with capital murder. The father was charged with abuse of a corpse. The couple was found shot dead in a car. Detectives say they think the killings were related to what they're calling a narcotics deal that went bad. Officials say more charges are pending, possibly relating to the death of an unborn child. Also, out of our Southern Bureau today, officials there say the fire we told you about at the home of Miami Dolphins player Tyreek Hill was sparked by a kid apparently playing with a lighter. The fire marshal says the whole thing was an accident and nobody was hurt, which is obviously very good news. And out of our Northeast Bureau, officials at MetLife Stadium, where the Jets and the Giants play, plan to take out more than 1,700 seats. Why? They've got to make the field wider for World Cup matches in 2026. MetLife is a contender to host the World Cup final, but they got to get that pitch right. We'll see. News today out of the FDA saying that it's gotten reports of things like hair loss and suicidal thoughts as potential side effects from weight loss drugs like Ozempic, Manjaro, Wagovi. Now, they haven't found definitive evidence that the drug leads to those symptoms, but they're now evaluating the need for more regulation on some of those new drugs that are just getting more and more popular. It comes as we're also seeing, new today, this groundbreaking push from Eli Lilly, the big drug company, to try to get its weight loss drug into more hands. They're launching a new website designed to help people in larger bodies find a doctor or a telehealth provider and get a prescription. And they can buy the drug directly from the company, which will ship right to their home, cutting out the pharmacy and an in-person doctor's visit. NBC's Maggie Vespa has more with the Eli Lilly CEO. Watch. Call it a direct plan of attack in America's battle against obesity, one that we thought warranted an inside look. Pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly today launching Lilly Direct, a one-stop shop website where users can find a doctor or telehealth provider and get some prescription medicines shipped to their door. A variety of medications will be available, but analysts say one of the fastest sellers will be the company's weight loss crown jewel, ZepBound, approved by the FDA in November to treat obesity. Eli Lilly CEO Dave Ricks sitting down with our team in an exclusive interview to talk about how this will work. Obviously, there are going to be questions from people about safety, oversight. Can you explain the role of physicians? Yeah, it's a critical part of how the site works. These drugs need to be used under the supervision of a physician, and we're just offering more choice in that regard. Are these independent physicians? Will they get any kind of incentives for prescribing ZetBound or your drugs? How does that relationship look? Yeah, key question. There is no 
relate, financial relationship between us and the physicians or the online uh, telehealth platforms. We're just providing offerings that patients can choose themselves and then consult with that physician. ZepBound is billed by Eli Lilly as the most effective weight loss drug in a $6 billion industry, which Goldman Sachs predicts will grow to $100 billion by 2030. This after rival drugs, Ozempic and Wagovi, in recent years took Hollywood by storm, with some stars criticized for using them for moderate weight loss while shortages mounted. That was before a direct option. Doesn't this make it easier for someone to do that? People might wonder. People might wonder that. That's not our focus, clearly. Those are not patients indicated in our label. I mean, the key there is the, phys is the physician uh, consultation. The, the doctors there to judge that need and to make a prescribing decision. Some critics have concerns. One is that easier access could mean more abuse by those who just want to lose a few pounds. Another is the motive behind direct access. They're trying hard to make sure that you can find a path to something that they absolutely want to sell you. That creates at least the appearance of conflict of interest. This is about patient success. Our sales will be the same either way, whether we sell it to uh, CVS or Walgreens or sell it on our website. Eli Lilly is the first pharmaceutical company to allow direct sales, but there have been other attempts to make these drugs more widely available. Weight Watchers acquired a telehealth company so customers can more easily get prescriptions. Novo Nordisk also offers a savings program for their drugs Ozempic and Wigovi. And there are ongoing efforts by Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk to make these drugs in oral versions as well as an easier alternative to the current injectables. Lynn Fenlison says she could have used other options after feeling dismissed by her doctor when she tried to question her weight loss medication. My physician just made an offhand joke that he had someone he knew who had taken the drug Monjuro and that was sort of the end of the conversation. I think a lot of people think of obesity as an issue of willpower. It's not. 40% of adult Americans have excess weight or obesity. That's a big number. Lynn, who has been overweight her entire life, eventually got her medication adjusted. She's lost 65 pounds so far. At the correct dosage, it shuts off the constant thought of food. I feel like a normal person for the first time. Maggie is joining us now. Um, it's so interesting to see the dynamics here. One of the dynamics, of course, is money, right? right? Like these drugs are known to be kind of expensive. Talk through that in this new process from Eli Lilly. What about insurance? What are the details? Yeah, that's huge. Obviously, these drugs are really expensive for a lot of people. Over $1,000 for a month's supply without insurance. And it's worth noting that about half, according to Eli Lilly, at least half of private insurance plans, like employer provided, don't cover drugs like ZepBound, drugs like this. Almost all of government provided, like Medicare, Medicaid, don't cover them. They're working to change that. But in the meantime, that is obviously a lot of money for a lot of Americans. So right now, this direct access plan Specifically, Eli Lilly says does not cut that cost, but separately, they also have a savings program that they say cuts that cost in half. The Hadley, we're still talking about $500 and some change per month for people. So that being said, Eli Lilly is aware that that's another priority moving forward. But in the meantime, we'll see how this direct access model works. Hadley. Maggie Vespa, thank you so much for bringing us uh, this story tonight. Appreciate it. Coming up, how one state is trying to totally change its prison system to make incarceration more restorative and rewarding. We're giving you an inside look behind the scenes at an experiment being called Prisony Land. Next. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we take you to California, where the state is looking to fundamentally change how it operates its prison system. The Department of Corrections there is testing a new model aimed at rehabilitation, at lowering violence behind bars, at cutting down the rates of reoffending after people get out. This pilot program is already happening at two of the state's biggest correctional facilities. And our Steve Patterson got rare access inside Valley State Prison for a firsthand look at the changes. From a distance, it's exactly what you would expect. Big fence, barbed wire, and of course, gun towers, like a prison postcard or something. So it's uh, nine, about nine o'clock in the morning. We're about 10 minutes away from going inside to Valley State Prison, supposedly one of the most progressive prisons in all of the country. Uh, the nickname is Prisneyland, although from the outside, uh, it looks pretty standard, but we'll see what the inside looks like. Let's go. Thank you. Right inside, not much difference. 
This is the deadly high voltage electric fence, apparently. I uh, obviously don't want to touch this. But the more you get to know Prisneyland, which officials say some locals refer to it as, you realize the first barriers coming down aren't actually physical. And as we were talking, we don't really call them inmates here. Incarcerated individuals. Incarcerated individuals. And that's where the differences between this prison and others around California just begin. Violence plagues our country's system of incarceration. When people get out, they have extreme difficulties finding a job. And while the data varies state by state, about half end up back in custody within a few years. All of that is why officials say the Golden State is trying to move in a new direction, starting a pilot program at two facilities with the goal to replicate the results in Scandinavia, where Norway says reforms over the last two Two and a half decades have brought down the rate of reoffending within two years to only 20%, much lower than here in the U.S. They've also decreased the prison population significantly and have helped people reincorporate into society after they serve their time. You have a key to your own cell. Yeah, everybody has their own key. Authorities here say the most important thing they're trying to change at Valley State Prison is how it feels. Well, this is the central courtyard. Yeah. I feel very peaceful just looking at it. <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah. Am I recording? <laughs> You're on, man. Officials told us the only way to truly understand the reforms is by coming and experiencing them. One of the principles of the California model is normalization. And, and the idea is we want to make the environment inside our institutions as, as normal as possible with the goal of not releasing somebody who's institutionalized, but releasing citizens back to the community who have practiced normal pro-social behavior. What about the argument that somebody might see this and say, well, isn't part of the goal punishment in some way? Why give them all of this nice stuff? So I, I would say that people go to court to be punished. That's up to our, our judges and our juries. And when they, when they come into our institutions, our goal is to basically help them become better citizens. So with, with that in mind, we are not in the punishment business. Um, we're in the rehabilitative yeah, business. Yeah. I found it. A big part of that rehabilitation, a wide array of programs where the population learns a variety of coping and calming skills. And she is a good horse. Did you know you were going to be grooming horses in prison? <laughs> no, to be honest, I thought I'd be uh, stuck in a cell, maybe a few re uh, rehabilitation groups, but it helps me, you know, cope with, you know, a lot of stresses I deal with, you know, day to day here yeah. in prison. The hope is that creating a more positive environment makes the men locked up here more willing to rehabilitate. Of the total incarcerated population of 3,000 here, the prison says 2,400 are enrolled in training or education programs, including high school and college. This day is the first day of the rest of our lives. We can start our day at any time. When you came in and you saw what this was, what was your impression? I thought I was going to come to prison and get worse, but coming to prison actually saved my life. Wow. Say it again. Coming to prison saved my life. Since they started running these programs in 2017, Valley State Prison says it's reduced violence compared to other peer facilities. According to reports from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, prisons across the state have seen between 15 and 32 homicides total each year between 2017 and 2021. At Valley State, zero. And only one recorded assault or battery against staff versus the hundreds at other facilities. Get in the middle, you guys are going to okay. circle me. All one right. of the most successful programs is dog training. Inmates working with puppies to become service dogs eventually sent to help people across the country. You know, for a long time, we were releasing uh, citizens back into the community that had not improved their thought process. Uh, they had not re rehabilitated from their behavior, and they go out and reoffend. And so, when you start to introduce rehabilitative programs, when you start to introduce hope into this community, you, you really are transforming their thought process. We followed a few of the dog trainers back to their cells. The doors lock from the outside, but they look a little more like something else. It feels like a dorm. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. Did you expect that when you came in? No. So not. right now we are walking your dog past the pool table, back to your spot in prison. That's pretty wild. So is this like the dog wing? It almost feels like to a lot of people that might watch this that... They're too easy on us. Yes. Uh, I would say uh, no, because a lot of us worked our ways down. Sure. So um, I came from a higher level and it took me seven years to come down to, to this. People that are going to see this and say, shouldn't prison be a punishment? 
in some way. It should be reformation too, but it should also be, it should suck, right? Yeah, so this doesn't suck. It does suck. It does suck. Okay, does tell suck. me why. It does suck, right? I don't, I don't get to hug my family. Right. Would you rather want somebody coming out and getting reformed or somebody coming in and getting out the same way they came in or worse? Steve Patterson, after taking us to Disneyland, is joining us now. We are so grateful to you for bringing us that inside look with that rare access, Steve. So here's a question, right? And some of those numbers, pretty, pretty noteworthy that you talked about as it relates to this particular facility. What about if one of the goals is to prevent reoffenders from coming back into the prison system? Is that actually working? Is it helping some of these incarcerated individuals, as they call them, lead more productive lives after they get out? You know, I think it's important to say all of this is still too early in the program's life. Okay. We're still in the proof of concept territory, right? This is a pilot program at two of the state's more than 30 prisons. What does it look like when you scale that up? We just don't know yet. What I can mm -hmm. say, though, is that the early data is really promising. The stories that we've heard both in the inside and the outside uh, speak volumes. And it's so important because we were able to get that access. So there's so much more reporting that we've done on this from the women's prison across the street to some of the vocations training that they're doing to a guy who was released from behind bars after more than 10 years. All of that, including some more of the data, I, I can't wait to share with you. Allie. We can't wait to see it more here on this show, Steve. We're going to have you right back here next week. Thank you so much, friend. Really appreciate all the hard work and time that you and your team uh, and your producer, PJ, have put into this. Thanks. We are coming on the air as some in Iowa are heading out for vigils after another day of deadly gun violence in America's schools. This time at a high school in Iowa, one sixth grader killed, other people hurt when a student started firing before the bell rang. We'll take you live on the ground with what we're just learning in the last couple of hours. Plus, the East Coast is set to see something it hasn't seen much of for a while, snow. But is it going to be a boom or a bust? We've got the forecast just ahead. Plus, any minute now, we could see more documents in that case involving Jeffrey Epstein. It could be more big names, perhaps. Our team is keeping an eye on that docket and what's coming out of the court. We'll have an update in just a couple of minutes. Plus, check out this video of a robbery in L.A. Cars backing into a store, then all these people running in to grab anything they can find, including money. We're going to bring you up to speed on the investigation into that. Plus, if love is blind, are producers turning a blind eye to bad behavior? That's the allegation from a contestant on that dating show who says the bosses ignored potential threats from the guy they set her up with. More on the legal fight that could bring a sea change to reality TV a little later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and as we're coming on the air tonight, people in Perry, Iowa, are gathering for vigils tonight after a sixth grader was killed and five other people were hurt when somebody opened fire at a high school. Police are confirming in just the last couple of hours that that suspected shooter is a student here. Here's what else we know right now, that this morning that 17-year-old started shooting first thing, right at the start of the day in what was supposed to be a welcome back on the first day after the holidays. After his attack, he died by suicide. With this school now, yet another school and yet another community in anger and in grief in this country. Late tonight, the town's police chief getting choked up. Watch. All of our condolences to the victims and their families. They need your thoughts and prayers, as well as time and space to process and to grieve. Classes are canceled, of course, at that school tomorrow, along with several other schools in the area. Adrian Broadus is on the ground for us in Perry, Iowa tonight. So let's start with what we know about this about what happened here is more details are starting to come out because it wasn't just a gun, right? Police are now saying that they found some kind of explosive. Yeah, they did say that, Hallie. This is just a tough way to start the second semester of the school year. It's a time when everyone was happy to be returning, but when they showed up here, terror. Let's begin with the victims. We know the numbers, but these are students, and they are children of people here in this community. Four of the victims, we were told, were students here. And the person who died, a sixth grader, likely 11 or 12-year-old when you're in 
the sixth grade. The now investigators say this shooting all happened in Perry High School, which is behind me. There was a mix of students here at that uh, time of the day for a breakfast program. Investigators also saying the first 911 call came in around 737 a.m. and there were multiple people calling 911. Authorities saying first responders got here to the school within seven minutes and when they arrived they found students inside sheltering in place and others running away from the high school. The other person that was injured was an administrator. We're told one person is in critical condition and the four others are in stable condition, Hallie. Besides their conditions, do we know anything else? I know that there are vigils that are set to start maybe the next half hour or so as people now reeling from what happened this morning are getting ready to try to begin to process some of this trauma, a process that is going to take, of course, months, years longer. Yeah, people need time to deal with what happened. They, We do know the shooter was a 17-year-old student here. We heard from a parent who says today has been a roller coaster of emotions. What was it like getting that phone call? Uh, actually, it was a text message this morning from my daughter, and it was absolutely horrifying. Like, that's one of the worst moments of my entire life, but the best phone call I got was saying that they were okay. I'm glad that they're okay. So a bit of relief for that parent, but still sadness knowing other families are grieving the loss of that sixth grader and other people who were injured here are in the hospital. I do want to point out that investigators say that 17-year-old had a small caliber handgun and a pump action shotgun. One thing students did say that they were happy class had not started because mm. if class had started, they say the outcome could have been much different. Allie. Adrian brought us. It's terrifying to even consider. Thank you very much for that reporting and for staying on top of this story for us. Let's take you overseas because tonight a top diplomat's on the move to try to keep the war between Israel and Hamas from spilling over into a bigger regional conflict. That's because Secretary of State Tony Blinken is on the way to the Middle East for the fourth time since October 7th, basically trying to calm things down after Tuesday's strike on a Beirut suburb that killed a senior Hamas commander. That has led to concerns now of a possible escalation, a big escalation between Hezbollah, militants in Lebanon, and the Israelis. Lincoln's got a lot on the plate. These are all the countries, all the places he's set to visit. You can see him here, all of it, while the war in Gaza, of course, continues. And tonight we're learning about the unprecedented rescue of the mother and uncle of a U.S. service member, both living in Gaza. They've been essentially caught in the crossfire there for months. You can see the mom. She's on the right there, sort of highlighted. The operation, apparently coordinated by U.S., Israeli, and Egyptian officials, is believed to be the first of its kind to pull civilians out of the battlefield in Gaza. NBC's Josh Letterman is in Tel Aviv for us. Let's start with Blinken's trip here, because as you and I talked about over the course of the last, I think, 48 hours now, the, the concern, right, is that this could, the, the, the tensions in the region could spark into something broader, broader and bigger and more dangerous and potentially more deadly. It seems like the goal of Blinken's trip here now, because of the events that have happened over the course of the last five days, the goal is to try to get a handle on some of those escalations to prevent it from going any further. What does he need to do to make that happen? Well, he's going to need to try to convince all of these other U.S. allies in the region, Hallie, like Turkey, United Arab Emirates, and others, uh, to try to play a productive role in tamping down those tensions, in discouraging uh, these various Iran-backed groups in Lebanon, uh, in Iraq, Syria, and in Yemen uh, from using this as an excuse to really ratchet this up into a regional war. But uh, that is one key part of his agenda. Well, he still has a long laundry list of uh, items to tick off uh, with the Israelis when he pays a visit uh, to Tel Aviv, including pushing for more humanitarian aid. Uh, he wants to advance talks to get those hostages back, uh, as well as talking about what's going to happen in the Gaza Strip uh, after Hamas is defeated, if the Israelis uh, are able to achieve that objective. Uh, and the State Department has been pretty open about the fact that this could be a very difficult visit. Take a look. We don't expect every conversation on this trip to be easy. There are obviously tough issues facing the region and difficult choices ahead. But the secretary believes it is the responsibility of the United States of America to lead diplomatic efforts to tackle those challenges head on. And he is prepared to do that in the days to come. 
One of those most tense issues, Hallie, uh, could be who is going to actually control the Gaza Strip after uh, this war is over uh, and whether Gazans will be allowed to go back to their homes. Because as several Israeli politicians in the last few days have suggested that Gazans should leave the Gaza Strip, the State Department has hit back very strongly, saying that is absolutely unacceptable and that that kind of talk needs to stop. And tonight, we did hear from the Israeli military saying that in what they envisioned for the Gaza Strip uh, after Hamas, uh, they do expect that it will be Palestinian run and that Gazans will be able to go back home. Part of this, too, and we, when we talk about Blinken Strip, Josh, maybe three weeks ago, right, end of last month, middle of last month, there was a question of could Blinken Strip help shake loose maybe some more negotiations for a pause, for a hostage release, because that is obviously still a huge issue on the table. We know that the head of the CIA has met with his counterparts in Warsaw to try to get something unstuck on that front. Where does that stand tonight? We've seen very little progress, and in fact, the situation seems to have gotten a little bit worse in that after that assassination uh, that we are reporting was an Israeli strike on a Hamas official in Beirut, Hamas said, look, the hostage talks are done for now, that they're not going to entertain any more of those negotiations. And so uh, Israelis are really holding their breath, hoping that those talks uh, get back on track. But right now, uh, Hamas is insisting that they are standing behind their position, that there will be no more hostages released uh, until there is a permanent ceasefire, which is something that Israel, uh, in its most recent plan uh, for the final stages of the war that they presented tonight, say is still quite a ways off, Hallie. Josh Letterman live for us in Tel Aviv. Josh, thank you so much for that reporting. We'll check back in with you, I know, in the days ahead. Let's bring it back home because tonight millions of people in this country are getting ready for a big winter storm that could bring a lot of rain and maybe a lot of snow to some parts of the East Coast this weekend. Kind of a messy mix. Think sloppy, right? Some spots like Connecticut are already seeing some snow coming down. You see some flurries there in Connecticut. The New York governor says today emergency response teams are already ready there. Let's get to Bill Karens, our meteorologist. And while it is snowing in the Hallie Jackson Now News Monitor, the question is, <laughs> is it going to be snowing on the I-95 corridor as well? Because these are places, and I'm going to include my, my town of D.C. in that, yeah. that really haven't seen a significant snowfall in, in almost two years at this point. Yeah, oh, I love that graphic. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> and congratulations. Uh, right, yeah, that, right. that, may, that may be the only snowflakes you see, Hallie. Uh, yeah, Washington, uh, D.C. area may get more rain than anything else. Uh, so let's talk about this storm and kind of play it out for you. We got so much happening in the next 10 days of weather and then this huge Arctic outbreak behind it. You're going to hear a lot of weather stories across the country in the next two weeks. Like we've unlocked the door and winter is going to come roaring through. So this storm right now, about 23 million people. Watches are up now for interior sections of New New England and also the Mid-Atlantic region. Tonight, the snow's Amarillo to Wichita. It's snowing right now in Albuquerque, by the way. Light snow, Chicago up through Detroit. Just a little coating over the next couple days. That's more or less Saturday morning. But the main event in the east, the thing that everyone's talking about, the heavier totals will be away from I-95. It looks like you may see some flakes, but possibly straight over almost to rain. D.C., Baltimore, Philly. New York has a chance for at least a little bit of snow, and then it probably will change over to rain. Uh, once you get to Hartford, though, there's going to be someone that's going to get 8 to about 14 inches of snow somewhere from the Catskills to interior section of New England. The forecast for all of these areas is going up. Hartford 6 to 10 wouldn't surprise me. It came close to a foot. Boston at the coast 3 to 6, but you go just inland on the I-95 loop and the totals will be a lot higher than that. So, Hallie, this will be a, a significant snowstorm, not paralyzing. You know, I know a lot okay. of kids are, a lot of kids are like, it's going to snow this weekend. Will, you know, will I have school off Monday? And I don't think so. I think they're going to have time to clean up. So all the teachers out there too, get all your work done and students be prepared. <laughs> because Monday you'll probably have to go to school. So then of all the events you're looking at over the next week and a half, Bill, what's the one that you are most concerned about, if any? Storm two. This first one's kind of like a weekend snowstorm in the middle of winter, uh, maybe more fun than, you know, hazardous. But storm two is going to cause a ton of problems. So here's the storms as they're lined up on the map. So this is storm one. This is the one we just talked about. This is where it is tomorrow. Storm two is now up here heading into areas of British Columbia. This will slide down the West Coast this weekend, causing snow and rain in typical areas all the way down the West Coast. This storm storm gets into the middle of the country, a powerful storm, very powerful. Like we're talking damaging wind, we're talking severe mm. weather, maybe tornadoes in the Gulf Coast. We're talking heavy rain on the East Coast with flooding concerns. Those areas I just talked about getting all that snow, it's going to be 50 degrees with two inches of rain Tuesday and Wednesday. That's a huge flag for areas like New Jersey and southern New England if that happens, and maybe the Catskills too. I mean, you're talking rapid snow melt, 50 degrees with two inches of rain, that's going to be horrible. Uh, so yeah, this storm could be bad. And then the one 
behind that, which is now all the way at the tail end of the Aleutian Islands out in the Pacific. This will become behind that one. This moves on to the West Coast uh, as we go throughout the middle of this weekend. And then this storm will be on bothering us next weekend, Hallie, on the East Coast. And then behind all of that, it gets brutally cold coast to coast. Right. So I hope everyone's ready. Buckle right. up. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone's enjoyed their nice, asking, quiet weather. To be honest. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Well, we're going to continue your list of storms yeah, yet to come. Winter is here. Uh, and yes. we've got to be buckled up and ready for it. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. I appreciate that. We'll talk again, I am sure, soon. Let's take it now to the lawyer for victims of Jeffrey Epstein, who says more court documents, potentially with more big names, could end up released in the days to come. So far, 40 exhibits and more than 900 pages have been unsealed in that first batch of documents with names of people linked to Epstein, released as part of a lawsuit against Epstein's longtime accomplice, Elaine Maxwell. Names like attorney Alan Dershowitz, magician David Copperfield, Prince Andrew, Michael Jackson, billionaire Glenn Dubin, Former President Bill Clinton, former President Donald Trump named in these docs. What does that mean that they're named? Simply that. Simply that their names are showing up. Just because their names are showing up doesn't mean they're accused of wrongdoing in these documents from a criminal perspective. Tom Winter is joining us now. We were expecting perhaps another trench, maybe another one after this. Can you just tell me what we know so far here tonight? Uh, sure, Hallie. I actually just checked the docket here as we were coming to air. I don't, I, I think what there has been is there's been a refiling of, uh, of documents. Okay. So that's what Great. we have uh, at this point. And that's um, somewhat to be expected because there are a whole ton of names here. And it's possible that some individuals objected to their personal information, telephone numbers, emails, the like uh, coming out. Central to what you've been talking about, what you've been discussing, yes, there are a lot of names here. But a lot of those names are familiar to people that have followed this story. Because as you and I kind of alluded to and, and kind of previewed yesterday, there were a number of names that were in Jeffrey Epstein's address book, his so-called black book. A lot of that came out in trial and previous civil litigation. And these names that you referenced are not accused of, of any wrongdoing, uh, just that these individuals were associated or, and we've seen the pictures here in the last several seconds, uh, have been with former presidents and have been associated with him in the past. And so there's a number of references uh, to all of these individuals. I think the most interesting one was that David Copperfield, at least according to the testimony of one of the individuals who says that she was recruited uh, for the basis of, uh, of conducting sexual massages with Jeffrey Epstein, said that David Copperfield asked her about the, uh, about the women that were hanging around and questioned their ages. But there's absolutely no indication at all that Copperfield was involved in any sort of wrongdoing. And he, of course, he's uh, denied any wrongdoing. Michael Jackson, who we're looking at now, was uh, somebody that that same woman identified as uh, one time being at Jeffrey Epstein's house. Again, no accusations there specific to Jackson. So a lot of high profile names. But as we talked about yesterday, not a lot of new information as far as uh, any sort of actual uh, wrongdoing or criminal conduct. And yet this is a story, right? This document drop that has captured the attention of the country. And I don't sure. think that's overstating it. I mean, you look, it's, it's headlines, sort of headline news everywhere. How do how should we be thinking about that piece of it? And what else is still to come here? Well, I expect uh, probably several hundred pages as soon as this evening. That's something we'll continue to follow. Uh, and, and obviously, we have a lot more to get through here. Last night was just kind of the first tranche, as you alluded to. As far as how we understand it, Hallie, I think it's important, obviously, and you and I have spoken about this before on and off camera, there's a lot of focus here on who is in Jeffrey Epstein's circle. Were any of these individuals involved with uh, abusing these underage girls? Uh, I think there's also the component here of how robust this police investigation was leading up to that what has been referred to as a sweetheart plea deal. They had a number of victims, very clear testimony, recorded phone calls, recorded conversations, police surreptitiously uh, recording as they brought some of these girls home talking about what happened because they didn't want to discuss what had happened initially to investigators. So I think it raises more questions ultimately about that plea deal. And as we talked about yesterday, that's something we're going to continue to watch for as these documents come out. Tom Winter, thank you. Uh, we will see if we get any action, of course, tonight or tomorrow as it relates to these documents. I know you're staying close to a camera. Thanks. A man who attacked a Vegas judge during his sentencing is now refusing to go back to court to face new charges today. And let me tell you, the video, you got to see it because this guy leaps over the bench. He attacks the judge. We're going to show it to you in a second, but I got to warn you first, it's graphic. Here it is. The Clark County District Judge, Mary Kay Holthus. The defendant comes, look at that, flying over the bench, lands on top of her. People jump in. 
You're seeing like court officials, the guy in a suit walks up. Uh, the judge is okay. She was hurt. She had some injuries, but is expected to be okay. You can see it here in slow motion. It's just unreal. A courtroom marshal was apparently hospitalized with a gash on his forehead that was bleeding and a dislocated shoulder. Liz Kreutz is joining us now. What happened? And, and, and how does that even happen in a courtroom? Yeah, it's raising a lot of security questions, Hallie. I will say I have some news for you since the last time we spoke. Uh, NBC News is now reporting that this uh, alleged attacker, this man, is now facing multiple new felony charges, including mm. battery and battery against a protected person, meaning the judge and her court staff. As you mentioned, he refused to appear in court today. He's expected back in court on Tuesday. We'll see if he shows up. He had been in court trying to um, ask for a plea deal. He had pled guilty to attempted battery with substantial bodily uh, harm. He has a history of violent offenses. He was trying to make the case that he was doing better and that he shouldn't be sentenced to prison again. The judge was not buying it. And she said to him, I think it's time for you to get a taste of something else. That seemed to trigger him because moments later is when this all unfolded. He jumped on over into the judge's bench there and just started tackling her. And that's what led to this whole bloody brawl, Hallie. So how is the Clark County Court, how are they responding to this? What are they saying about this? Yeah, well, we should say that we're expecting a press conference from the chief judge there in about 40 minutes. So we'll be okay. monitoring that. They did release a statement where they did acknowledge uh, some of the security concerns. They said that they're reviewing their protocols, that of course safety is an important priority for them and they're going to do whatever it takes to maybe review those protocols to help their employees. And this again raises these questions about the safety for judges and retaliation that they face, not just in the courtroom, but in their homes at times. There was that case in 2020 of the federal judge, Judge Esther Salas, where that man came to her home, uh, shot her husband multiple times and killed her 20-year-old son. Uh, other cases as well. And those have led to some legislation across the country to try to protect judges, protect their personal information. Uh, but of course, now some are asking whether or not even the courtrooms themselves need to be reconfigured in some ways to protect judges too. Liz Kreutz, uh, thank you so much for that reporting. We'll see what other details we get later on tonight. We'll have that here, I know, on this network as we get it. Thank you. Let's get to some news just breaking into us in the last couple of minutes. Groups of voters now in two more states, in both Illinois and Massachusetts, are now filing motions to try to get former President Trump off their 2024 primary ballots. NBC's Ryan Riley is following this for us. This is part of a larger issue as it relates to ballot access for former President Trump, most notably in the state of Colorado, where he is now asking the Supreme Court to essentially get him back on that ballot. What do we know about what's happening in Illinois and Massachusetts? Because right now it seems to be groups of voters, right? It is not um, like judges or whatever. How much teeth does this have? Yeah, right. So everyone's getting in on this now. Uh, they're just all petitioning all these various states, so states who haven't had these these before. Groups of voters are getting behind this. Essentially, what you have here is a liberal organization that is organizing groups of voters in this various state, in these various states right now, Massachusetts and Illinois, uh, to file with their local boards to file these petitions and say that Donald Trump is ineligible because he engaged in insurrection, as the Fourteenth Amendment sort of lays out. And obviously, we're sort of in uncharted territory here. But ultimately, all of this is going to make its way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court obviously is going to be handling a lot of these issues as we go into 2026. It's essentially, you know, campaign reporters might want to start camping out outside of SCOTUS because we're really going to have all of these cases that are ultimately uh, making their way to the Supreme Court. And that's where so many of these issues of the 2024 election are going to be decided. Any timeline on when we think we might get any resolution on these particular incidences? Not yet, but I mean, you know, obviously the, the Supreme Court is sort of looming over all of this, and I think yeah, that's, that's right. going to lead to where how these other cases are handled. But, you know, obviously Trump states have to start printing their ballots soon. So even if you ha don't have an election for a few months, you're going to actually have to print your ballots ahead of time. You have to mail them out uh, to voters overseas, for example, military voters. So there are a lot of impending deadlines coming, and, you know, we're really in the thick of this already. We're in 2024 now. This is uh, no longer something that we can sort of put uh, off to the side. We are in an election year now. Any response I should ask from the Trump campaign on this? I know that they've responded, of course, to the other issues in Colorado and Maine, et cetera. 
It just broke, so we haven't had anything uh, from the Trump right. folks here. But, you know, they have to respond to all these petitions as well, right? So they have to build all these up. I think, obviously, they're sort of focusing all of their efforts right now um, on that Colorado case. Uh, but, you know, there are a number of states where this is, this is piling up. But you also have states who have rejected this. And it, it differs in how these are handled in various states. So you have to sort of do this, this quick, you know, uh, quick Googling and sort of uh, catching up very quickly to how these are handled individually. Because in some states, you have a situation where it's the Secretary of State who makes that decision. In some states, there's a board of individuals. And then, you know, obviously, the Colorado case is a different case where the Colorado Supreme Court ultimately decided this. And that litigation progressed a lot further um, than it has, where they're just sort of kicking this off uh, from the beginning. But what they want to do is remove Donald Trump uh, from the Republican uh, primary ballot initially here. And obviously, you know, they would obviously want to not have him on the general election ballot as well. Yeah, Trump's attorneys have argued that they believe this would be disenfranchisement for those voters. We'll see. It's up to the justices, at least for Colorado at this point. Ryan Riley, thank you so much for scrambling to a camera with that new reporting. Coming up in New York, two subway trains colliding in Manhattan. New details we're getting right now about what happened. Plus, a big lawsuit against Netflix and its production company. Why one contestant from Love is Blind wants out of her NDA. To a legal fight now that has the potential to make a sea change in reality TV as we know it. And it's starting with Love is Blind. A contestant from that show is fighting with Netflix and its production company Delirium after they went after her for breaking her NDA. Have you seen Love is Blind? Do you know it? It's the show that, like, basically tries to get people to get engaged before they ever actually see each other, right? Idea being you base it on personality and conversation and not on looks. Well, this contestant, Renee Pache, claims the guy she got engaged to ended up being violent and the producers did not do enough when she brought it to their attention. Watch. They all mm -hmm. saw his violence. They, this was not surprising. It wasn't hidden. It was, I think they were just as scared as I was, but they didn't, you know, let me stop filming. So she's talking about it, and now Poche's lawsuit says Delirium wants $4 million for violating an NDA. She wants that NDA thrown out. We reached out to Netflix and Delirium for comment. They didn't get back to us. Let's bring in Chloe Malas here. So let's go micro and then macro. Chloe, start micro with the specifics of what happened here with this Love is Blind incident. Poche says she finished out the show, but then her storyline didn't actually air. What's the case? So... Hallie, she says, you know, she's this Texas veterinarian and she was approached in 2021 to appear on this hit show, Love is Blind. Like you said, there's all this romance before you meet each other and it's all done behind like these like shadowy mm -hmm. walls. And, you know, you're supposed to kind of like fall in love with someone's personality before you ever see them, um, you know, because it's what's in the heart. It's not what's outside. But she says that when she got paired up with this guy, that it turns out that he was homeless, addicted to drugs, a negative amount in his bank account, and that he was violent, and that she was actually warned by producers while filming that he needed, she needed to make sure that he didn't have access to firearms because they were concerned that he might hurt himself, and that she voiced her concerns to producers and to those around her that she did not feel comfortable. And Delirium TV uh, the production company that puts out Love is Blind. They haven't returned NBC News's request for comment. But what they have said previously is that they have a pretty strict vetting process. Now, she is, you know, counter suing uh, for undisclosed claims because she's saying, first of all, I made $8,000 from the show and you're suing me for $4 million for an NDA that I believe is illegal and unenforceable. Here's a little bit from Danny Savalos, our NBC News legal correspondent what he had to say. While arbitration clauses and NDAs are generally enforceable, sometimes they're too ambitious. They go too far and they break the law. In California, for example, a non-disparagement clause cannot prevent someone from reporting illegal conduct. So she says that Delirium TV, Poche says, that they are trying to silence her that they don't want the truth to come out of what is actually taking place on that show, Hallie. So go, so it's fascinating to, to see and hear these details, Chloe, but go macro here, right? Because this legal fight has the potential, maybe, depending on how it goes, 
to affect not just this specific show or production company, but for more of the industry as a whole. Explain that. I would imagine it would have to do with the use of MBAs, for example, or with some of these vetting procedures, et cetera. So Bethany Frankel, who you might know from The Real Housewives of New York, that's where she rose to fame, she has been on a crusade to go after these production companies, these NDAs, and these reality franchises saying, you pay next to nothing for these people, you make so much money, and you create these unsafe, at times, working conditions and so she's been very public about this and I think that lawsuits like these and Poche has hired Mark Garagos a very very well-known mm. uh, attorney to represent her I think that these are the types of cases that could change the face of reality TV and the types of the ways that they put these shows together I want you to listen to Brian Stelter um, a former CNN colleague of mine um, and now he works at Vanity Fair and listen to what he had to say because he's an expert when it comes to television what we might be seeing across the reality TV space is a rebalancing of power, giving some of these contestants a little bit more power and changing the working conditions that these shows are produced under. It'll be interesting to see if anything changes because reality TV, the reason why you see so much of it is because it's a lot cheaper to make. Um, and we saw the rise of it during the the Hollywood strikes that took place, not this one, but the one before the one that we just had. That is where you saw these shows like Big Brother and Survivor really boom. And it'll be interesting to see now that there's so much reality TV everywhere, will there be more lawsuits like this one? Totally. What other stories are out there, Hallie? And could reality TV change as we know it. Chloe Malas, thank you so much for all of that, uh, that detail and that reporting. Really appreciate it. We've got some stunning new surveillance video out of Southern California tonight. You got to see it showing the moments that this, it's called a street takeover, turned into like a total basically burglary. So look at this. A white car reverses into this local bakery. It's in Compton. It happened less than a mile away from where this street takeover was happening. A big group of people, people come out, cars take over the intersection, they do turns, they show off their cars, they do drifting. Then this happens. Dozens of people end up going into the store. A lot of them are masked. You see here, they're grabbing everything, jumping on the counters, taking items, taking money, taking pretty much anything here, knocking stuff over, moving things around. Let's bring in Maya Eaglin, who's got more. What happened to these people? Were any of them caught? Was there any fallout here? Hi, Hallie. So Los Angeles officials say that no one was hurt in this incident and no arrests have been made yet. But we do know that this group of about 100 people organized in the streets around 3 a.m. Tuesday, right before a white Kia backed into the front of Ruben's Bakery and Mexican food. Now, according to police, the looters grabbed drinks, food, lotto tickets and even meat scales before the small store was scheduled to reopen at 6 a.m. Hallie. What about the community more broadly here, right? The idea of a street takeover, the idea of these kinds of incidents happening, it's not, you know, this is obviously extraordinarily dramatic video, so it's hitting sort of a level of newsworthiness that we haven't often seen, but talk us through the bigger picture. Yeah, we've been seeing an increase in looting and shoplifting across the country. This is definitely not an isolated incident. According to a 2023 study from the Council on Criminal Justice, New York and Los Angeles have experienced the highest increases in shoplifting, with Virginia Beach and Dallas coming right behind. These crimes are leaving residents frustrated, and Compton's Mayor Emma Sharf had this to say about the incident. Ensuring the safety of businesses and residents in our city is our top priority. No local business should endure such fear and destruction. So we'll be keeping an eye on if any arrests will be made in this case. Hallie? Maya England, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, at least two dozen people have been hurt after one subway rear-ended another in Manhattan, creating a little derailment that led to a big disruption of subways throughout the city right in the evening commute, according to transportation officials. They're still looking into what exactly went wrong. Number two, the Vatican is defending the Pope's recent move to allow blessings for same-sex couples. This new rule came out last month and was immediately hit with criticism from some bishops around the world who said they would not implement this policy. The Vatican insists there's nothing heretical involved in the Pope's decision. Number three, police in New Zealand say a fisherman's survival ended up being a miracle after he fell into the water trying to reel in a fish. He lost access to his boat, was in the water almost 24 hours, but managed to use his watch to catch sunlight reflecting to get the attention of other fishermen. He's hypothermic, but is expected to be okay. 
Number four, TGI Fridays is shutting down 40 of its restaurants this week across 12 states. Stores that were underperforming, the company says, but the closure is part of its ongoing growth strategy. It's offering more than 1,000 transfer opportunities for people, employees, who worked at those stores that are closing down. Number five, data analytics firm Sirium just released results on the most on-time airport in the world, the most punctual airport in the world. And guess what? It's here in America. Guess which one it is? Do you know? If I said MSP, would that be a hint? Yes, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Congratulations, take a bow. You are functionally punctual, friend. Hey, SLC, also get hyped because you're number five on the list. A lot of on-time departures. We love to see it. Thank you. Big fans. All right, let's get to some breaking news now just into us here. More documents related to Jeffrey Epstein have now been released by a New York federal court as part of that lawsuit against Jelaine Mac Maxwell, Epstein's longtime accomplice. Um, again, this is coming into us. We've literally just got the filings in the docket. We know that 19 exhibits and 327 pages of previously sealed Epstein-related documents have been filed. Our team is working on combing through them. You can imagine, if you've ever seen a court document, this stuff is dense. There's a lot here. We want to be careful what we can report. It is not altogether unexpected that we are getting another batch of documents. If you've been watching the show for the last 30 minutes, you probably heard our conversation with Tom Winter suggesting, predicting, based on what we understand from our reporting, that there would be more batches of this stuff coming out. Uh, again, anybody named in these documents? For at this moment, not doesn't mean they did anything wrong necessarily. It just means that they are part of this broader uh, lawsuit, this broader sort of linkage here, at least linked to Jeffrey Epstein here. So we are looking through these documents. We're going to see what we find. As soon as we get any information, we're going to bring it to you right here on NBC News Now. Give us a beat. We'll be right back. 2024 candidate and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is tonight pushing back on the idea that he's no longer the top challenger to former President Trump as we close in now less than two weeks to the Iowa caucuses with the governor speaking in a new exclusive sit down with NBC News and the Des Moines Register. Here's our own Dasha Burns. Listen. But you're then much my closer in the race the... to Nikki Haley than you are to Trump. What happened? Well, no. I mean, first of all, Trump has always been leading in the race. I mean, he's the former president. He's uh, one of the most famous people in there. But you're not even the top there. challenger so to we're, him now. We are the top. Um, they wouldn't be spending that money if we weren't the top. I'm the only one that has a chance to beat Trump and win the general election. So that's what the governor says. What do the polls say? Well, they show that former President Trump looks poised to take the lead, because that's where he's sitting now. Uh, whoever takes second place could end up double digits behind him, meaning that, yes, part of the discussion here is the fight for second place. Former President Trump hasn't been in the state a ton, although he will be a lot this weekend. He's heading there tomorrow for a whole bunch of stuff, eight events starting Friday. You can see all the stops across Iowa he will, he will be at. NBC's Dasha Burns is in Iowa tonight as well. She's joining us now. So it's interesting to hear about this, Dasha, because listen, we, we are not fortune tellers here. Anything, many things could happen between now and the Iowa caucuses about 13 days away, right? Sure, like that is, that is within the realm of possibility here. What mm -hmm. looks likely, right, if you look at the past precedent of history over the course of the last several months, is perhaps not much movement in the polls because we just haven't seen movement in the polls for the last several weeks. So how is Ron DeSantis and his team, importantly, grappling with this? Because it's one thing to hear from the candidate publicly on camera with you at the Des Moines Register. It's another to talk about ground game, about resources, where they're putting their money and their resources. Right. There's we're not fortune tellers, but what is likely we don't know. And what is uh, true, what we do yeah. know is what we've seen with this campaign over the course of the last year or so is that this guy started as the top contender, the, the guy that was fighting for first place with Donald Trump. And now he has found himself double digits behind Trump. And as I said, they're closer to Nikki Haley now fighting for second place. And in front of the camera with us, at least the way he's grappling with it, is denying that that's the case. He still says that uh, he is number one to, to, to beating Trump. But in terms of ground game, I mean, they have really focused in on Iowa. It, all bets are on the Hawkeye State. And in terms of the path forward after this, well, he hasn't necessarily articulated a very clear one. Just take a listen. 
wins in the Iowa basket. That's can not true. Can you name another that, state that think you true. could win? That's not true. Can you name another state you could win? Yes, yes. You wait till what, what happens when we get out of Iowa. It's going to create, another a, state create a lot win? of. We're going to be able to win a lot of states. We have a great can organization in New Hampshire. We have a great organization in South Carolina. Do you Carolina. think you could win New Hampshire? We can have a lot of great organizations throughout Super Tuesday. I think that answer or, or lack thereof probably says a lot there, Hallie. Also interesting, you talked about the great organization in Iowa and then South Carolina, but skipped New Hampshire. And so uh, kudos to you for jumping in and, and trying to push that point here. When you talk about the person who is the front runner, it's former President Trump. We showed the map of all the places he's going to. It feels like this is a move to try to build up some momentum to make sure that people do turn out for the caucuses for him. Although it's interesting to hear how some of those uh, in his orbit are trying to now say, well, you know, people may be a little embarrassed to show up for Donald Trump, but it sounds like there's some expectation setting happening, even on the margins. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, Iowa is, uh, you know, the, the momentum and the narrative setting state. And there's a little bit of interesting history with, with Iowa and New Hampshire when it comes to Republicans. In the modern era, no Republican has won those two states back to back. The other thing here, as we learned from some Trump advisors, is that Iowa is a state where they're sort of beta testing their general election strategy because uh, it is a caucus, which means that organization is really critical here. And they're trying trying to see if they can expand Trump's electorate, because as we know, uh, it's really hard to flip a voter from Biden to Trump, right? But Trump does have a lot of pull with first-time voters, so they've got a really granular database strategy to try to turn out first-timers that they're trying here in the primary that they hope will work in the general, and that experimentation, it's, it's really a question mark of how that's going to play out, so that might be part of the factor here too, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Iowa. We are so glad to see you. Real quick, Dasha, who's next in your Closing Arguments interview series? We've got Nikki Haley tomorrow, All so right. look out. Sounds good. We'll be watching. We'll see you here then for that wrap-up. Dasha, thank you so much. Again, that's that exclusive interview series that Dasha's doing with the Des Moines Register. Nikki Haley, tomorrow. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Sweden, thousands of homes have lost power. A bunch of cars got stuck because of, obviously, it's super cold. There's a lot of snow. You can see those cars here. Temperatures dropped to below 36. Look at that, 35 below zero in some spots. Out of Denmark, Queen Margrethe making her final public appearance today before she steps down from the throne later this month. You can see her riding through Copenhagen in a horse-drawn carriage. She's the longest reigning monarch in Europe. She's been on the throne for more than 50 years. And in a rare move for Denmark royalty, she is abdicating the throne to her son. And out of Australia, the biggest male specimen of the world's most venomous spider. Ugh, I'm sorry to do this to you. It was found north of Sydney, fortunately not on this continent. That is Hercules, and he is three inches long. Officials say they're gonna extract his venom and use it for a life-saving anti-venom program. So there's your nightmare fuel for the day. You're welcome. I'm sorry. Coming up, how one state is trying to totally change its prison system to make incarceration more restorative and more rewarding. We're gonna give you an inside look at an experiment getting called Prisony Land. Coming up. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we take you to California, where the state is looking to fundamentally change how it operates its prison system. The Department of Corrections there is testing a new model aimed at rehabilitation, at lowering violence behind bars, at cutting down the rates of reoffending after people get out. This pilot program is already happening at two of the state's biggest correctional facilities. And our Steve Patterson got rare access inside Valley State Prison for a first-hand look at the changes. From a distance, it's exactly what you would expect. Big fence, barbed wire, and of course, gun towers, like a prison postcard or something. So it's uh, nine, about nine o'clock in the morning. We're about 10 minutes away from going inside to Valley State Prison, supposedly one of the most progressive prisons in all of the country. Uh, the nickname is Prisneyland, although from the outside, uh, it looks pretty standard, but we'll see what the inside looks like. Let's go. Thank you. Right inside, not much difference. 
This is the deadly high voltage electric fence, apparently. I uh, obviously don't want to touch this. But the more you get to know Prisneyland, which officials say some locals refer to it as, you realize the first barriers coming down aren't actually physical. And as we were talking, we don't really call them inmates here. Incarcerated individuals. Incarcerated individuals. And that's where the differences between this prison and others around California just begin. Violence plagues our country's system of incarceration. When people get out, they have extreme difficulties finding a job. And while the data varies state by state, about half end up back in custody within a few years. All of that is why officials say the Golden State is trying to move in a new direction, starting a pilot program at two facilities with the goal to replicate the results in Scandinavia, where Norway says reforms over the last two Two and a half decades have brought down the rate of reoffending within two years to only 20 percent, much lower than here in the U.S. They've also decreased the prison population significantly and have helped people reincorporate into society after they serve their time. You have a key to your own cell. Yeah, everybody has their own key. Authorities here say the most important thing they're trying to change at Valley State Prison is how it feels. Well, this is the central courtyard. Yeah. I feel very peaceful just looking at it. <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah. Am I recording? <laughs> You're on, man. Officials told us the only way to truly understand the reforms is by coming and experiencing them. One of the principles of the California model is normalization. And, and the idea is we want to make the environment inside our institutions as, as normal as possible with the goal of not releasing somebody who's institutionalized, but releasing citizens back to the community who have practiced normal pro-social behavior. What about the argument that somebody might see this and say, well, isn't part of the goal punishment in some way? Why give them all of this nice stuff? So I, I would say that people go to court to be punished. That's up to our, our judges and our juries. And when they, when they come into our institutions, our goal is to basically help them become better citizens. So with, with that in mind, we are not in the punishment business. Um, we're in the rehabilitative yeah, business. Yeah. I found it. Go to bat, all right, perfect. A big part of that rehabilitation, a wide array of programs where the population learns a variety of coping and calming skills. And she is a good horse. Did you know you were going to be grooming horses in prison? <laughs> no, to be honest, I thought I'd be uh, stuck in a cell, maybe a few re uh, rehabilitation groups, but it helps me, you know, cope with, you know, a lot of stresses I deal with, you know, day to day here in prison. The hope is that creating a more positive environment makes the men locked up here more willing to rehabilitate. Of the total incarcerated population of 3,000 here, the prison says 2,400 are enrolled in training or education programs, including high school and college. This day is the first day of the rest of our lives. We can start our day at any time. When you came in and you saw what this was, what was your impression? I thought I was going to come to prison and get worse, but coming to prison actually saved my life. Wow. Say that again. Coming to prison saved my life. Since they started running these programs in 2017, Valley State Prison says it's reduced violence compared to other peer facilities. According to reports from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, prisons across the state have seen between 15 and 32 homicides total each year between 2017 and 2021. At Valley State, zero. And only one recorded assault or battery against staff versus the hundreds at other facilities. Get in the middle, you guys are going to okay. circle me. One right. of the most successful programs is dog training. Inmates working with puppies to become service dogs eventually sent to help people across the country. You know, for a long time, we were releasing uh, citizens back into the community that had not improved their thought process. Uh, they had not re rehabilitated from their behavior, and they go out and reoffend. And so, when you start to introduce rehabilitative programs, when you start to introduce hope into this community, you, you really are transforming their thought process. We followed a few of the dog trainers back to their cells. The doors lock from the outside, but they look a little more like something else. It feels like a dorm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Did you expect that when you came in? No. So not. right now we are walking your dog past the pool table, back to your spot in prison. That's pretty wild. So is this like the dog wing? It almost feels like to a lot of people that might watch this that... They're too easy on it. Yes. Uh, I would say uh, no, because a lot of us worked our ways down. Sure. So um, I came from a higher level and it took me seven years to come down to, to this. People that are gonna see this and say, shouldn't prison be a punishment? 
in some way. It should be Reformation too, but it should also be, it should suck, right? Yeah, so this doesn't suck. It does suck. It does suck. Okay, does tell suck. me why. It does suck, right? I don't, I don't get to hug my family. Right. Would you rather want somebody coming out and getting reformed or somebody coming in and getting out the same way they came in or worse? Steve Patterson, after taking us to Disneyland, is joining us now. We are so grateful to you for bringing us that inside look with that rare access, Steve. So here's a question, right? And some of those numbers, pretty, pretty uh, noteworthy that you talked about as it relates to this particular facility. What about if one of the goals is to prevent reoffenders from coming back into the prison system? Is that actually working? Is it helping some of these incarcerated individuals, as they call them, lead more productive lives after they get out? You know, I think it's important to say all of this is still too early in the program's life. Okay. We're still in the proof of concept territory, right? This is a pilot program at two of the state's more than 30 prisons. What does it look like when you scale that up? We just don't know yet. What I can say, though, is that the early data is really promising. The stories that we've heard both in the inside and the outside uh, speak volumes. And it's so important because we were able to get that access. So there's so much more reporting that we've done on this from the women's prison across the street to some of the vocations training that they're doing to a guy who was released from behind bars after more than 10 years. All of that, including some more of the data, I, I can't wait to share with you. Alex. We can't wait to see it more here on this show. Steve, we're going to have you right back here next week. Thank you so much, friend. Really appreciate all the hard work and time that you and your team uh, and your producer, PJ, have put into this. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.